Salutations to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate, who came to establish religion universal. Let us pray to Him to lead us from the unreal to the real, to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality. Today's topic I have chosen from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna about the supreme importance of the teachings of the scriptures. the uplifting teaching of the scriptures shri ramakrishna has very clearly stated that reading of scriptures is very essential and important he also said that not simply reading all through the life merely to acquire scholarship that he did not encourage the scriptures are to be read to be followed they are meant to be practiced so the value of scriptures lies in practice if you practice the instructions given in the scriptures we become recipient of the divine knowledge the glory of our true self so today's topic i have chosen as the uplifting teaching of the scriptures harmony on this earth requires a restoration of human values that comes through an understanding and experiencing of the sacred wisdom right ideals will be restored as the concept of unity permeates humanity the teachings of the sacred wisdom recorded long ago in the ancient vedas have been preserved and made available down the ages to the earnest seeker the light of these ancient teachings dispels ignorance just as dawn replaces darkness so the scriptures are really glorious and save us from all confusion problems and sufferings shri ramakrishna said in the gospel brahman the supreme divine cannot be described in words it is said in the rama gita that brahman has been indirectly hinted at by the scriptures they give the example when one speaks about the cowherd village on the ganges one indirectly states that the village is situated on the bank of the ganges so sri ramakrishna has said there are many scriptures like the vedas but one cannot realize the divine without austerity without spiritual discipline so study of scriptures become effective only when you undertake austerity and discipline simply reading will lead you nowhere but one should learn the contents of the scriptures and then act according to their injunction these are all words of sri ramakrishna in the gospel he gives the example a man lost a letter he couldn't remember where he had left it he began to search for it with a lamp after two or three people had searched it the letter was at last found the message in the letter was please send us five shares of sandesh and a piece of wearing cloth that's the message the man read it and then threw the letter away there was no further need of it now all he had to do was to buy the five shares of sandesh and the piece of cloth that's the action part so knowing is meant for doing knowing not simply hearing it through one year and letting off to another year no to practice it in fact all these scriptures are most invaluable treasures they are all recordings of the direct experiences of the mahatmas again shri ramakrishna said 
what is the goal of books or scriptures shri ram himself puts the question and he himself answers the question the attainment of god a man opened a book belonging to a sadhu what did he see he saw the word rama written on every page there is nothing else if a man loves god even the slightest thing kindles spiritual feeling in him then repeating the name of rama but once he gets the fruit of 10 million sandhyas so much merit he gets at the sight of a cloud the peacock's emotion is awakened it dances spreading its tail radha had the same experience just the sight of a cloud recalled lord krishna to her mind chaitanya deva another great incarnation was passing a village he heard the drums were from the earth of that place at once he was overwhelmed with ecstasy because drums are used in kirtan but who can have this spiritual awakening next point shri ramkrishna points out it is not for everybody to have this awakening it doesn't simply happen in a mechanical way no shri ramkrishna says only he who has renounced his attachment to worldly things he only can have the spiritual awakening if the sap of attachment is totally dried up in a man the slightest suggestion kindles his spiritual emotion though you strike a wet match a thousand times it will not produce a spark but if it is dried the slightest rubbing will set it aflame how nicely very forcefully shri ramakrishna has said how true it is we are suffering because of attachment involvement in the things ephemeral the sacred wisdom of the vedas veda means that which makes you know the vedas were recorded in ancient times but pure seers who had attained the ultimate self realization they saw these truths in their quiet states of highest intuition which is why they are called seers the vedas had no one source or author but arose from the records of many ancient sages who recorded them as a science of attaining enlightenment the one single object that the vedas have in view is to make man divine man or woman is a general term they lead him from the animal stage where he completely identifies with the body and suffers hunger thirst and desires of various kinds to this stage where he recognizes that his human state is far greater than the animal from there the vedas awaken in the seeker the intelligence and discrimination that must be used to sublimate the passions and emotions to the level of divinity after attaining the divine state the seeker experiences only eternal bliss the vedas deal with the science of the spirit they contain the knowledge and procedures necessary to liberate oneself from bondage and blindness but mere learning of them is no use they have to be put into practice that is the purpose of these revelations The Vedas are the whisperings of God to man and they have been passed down and kept intact since ancient times. The Vedic teachings are explained and elaborated in the Upanishads, Shastras and the Puranas. The same teachings are enshrined in the popular Eastern classics Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita. All these teach the ultimate truth that all this is brahman the eternal transcendent god who permeates all and is given various names by different religions the individual arises as a wave on the ocean and eventually merges back into the ocean of brahman the mergence is an ecstatic reunion after a prolonged journey of isolation through space time and form 
sages who have attained to this state of ultimate knowledge of God have proclaimed that everything in this world and the entire universe is nothing but this Brahman who shines with the effulgence of a billion suns. This is the highest state that can be achieved and is referred to as Advaita, one without a second. In the Advaitic state of ultimate realization, Brahman or God is experienced as one without a second. In this state of ecstatic union with Brahman, the appearance of duality of forms, people, animals, objects that were previously seen to exist separately in this world as what we call objective reality dissolve into the single sight of the entity of Brahman which is eternal and formless and yet contains all form within it. This transcendent state of ultimate union is referred to in the powerful mantras Aham Brahmasmi I am Brahman and Soham He am I It is referring to the Atman the indwelling consciousness in individual being is referred to and that is nothing but Brahman himself. Swami Vivekananda had this experience of perceiving everything as Brahman by the graceful touch of Sri Ramakrishna. The whole universe was filled with uniform undivided consciousness. Swami Vivekananda experienced it. This state of mergence with the Absolute is referred to by many terms in various religions. Vedanta is that body of thought which contains the wisdom of the Vedas. It deals with this science of self-realization by which the individual and temporary wave of consciousness can merge into the eternal ocean of Satchidananda. Existence, knowledge, bliss, which is Brahman or the Supreme God. This state is attained only through Tyaga, Sacrifice, the transcending of likes and dislikes, desires and prejudices of the ego and the state of individuality. One who has attained this state sees all as inherently divine and therefore strives to serve all others as repositories of that same Godhead. In the Vedantic knowledge, the eternal witness within every living being is called the Atman. The word Atman means light or effulgence. The Atman is the very core of each individual which registers all feelings, thoughts, consciousness and awareness. Western science has taught us that our living forms or bodies have evolved from simple one-celled organisms into the complex organization of the human body as it exists today. Inherent in this view is that our thoughts and feelings arise as illusions from the electrical nerve activity in the brain. But the sage knows the body to be secondary and dependent on the primary spirit within. Without the spiritual Atman the perceiver of all thoughts, feelings and sensations, the organically living form would fall down senseless in an instant. The spiritual entity is a cohesive force behind the physical organization and once the Atman withdraws from the body, disintegration begins immediately. That's how we say death. What death actually means? Atman getting out of the cage of the body. When the Atman leaves the body, the body gets into disintegration. The Upanishads are that section of the Vedas which deal with the higher wisdom. The name Upanishads means steadfast study of the means of attaining to the ultimate reality. There are in all 108 Upanishads of which 10 have gained popularity through the commentaries by Acharya Shankar, the great spiritual teacher of the East. One of the 10 Upanishads most famous, the Kata Upanishad, deals specifically with the subject of the Atman. To the very few is it given to hear about the Atman. 
Many more who hear of the Atman do not understand. Wonderful is a person who speaks of it. Intelligent is a person who learns of it. Most blessed is he who hears it from a knowing teacher and understands it. The Kathopanishad contains the story of the young and virtuous Nachiketas. When the father of Nachiketas gives away inferior gifts as part of a ritual ceremony, the boy tries to lessen the impact of this serious error in judgment. The father gets angry and in disgust at his interference shouts that he is going to give the son away to Yama, the god of death. The son resolves that the words uttered by the father should not be untrue so he proceeds to the residence of Yama to offer himself up as a ritualistic gift. The boy spends three nights waiting to see the god. When Yama discovers his presence, he feels sorry that the boy had to wait so long, so he decides to grant him three boons, one for each night he waited. Natsiketas asks, first, that when he returns home, his father will have shed his anger and gained mental equanimity, and so welcome him home. That's the first. Second, he asks to know the secret of the absence of hunger and fear of death in the heaven worlds. Yama gladly grants these boons and further initiates his new disciple into the details of a special ritual ceremony. Yama sees the reverence, intelligence and eagerness of his new student and is much pleased with him. Nachiketas then asks for his third boon. He tells his new te- his teacher, Some say that death is not the end, that there is an entity called the Atman which survives the body and senses. Teach me, sir, that secret of the Atman. Yama was stunned. At first he resists and decides to test him to see if he is deserving of this unique knowledge. So Yama offers him many other attractive boons involving worldly prosperity and happiness. But Dachikita firmly declines these ephemeral favors. The alternative boons you hold before me cannot assure me the everlasting benefit that Atma Jnana alone can bestow. Yama is again pleased with his pupil and decides he is fit to receive the highest wisdom. The remainder of the Upanishad contains Yama's teachings to Dachikita's. The young disciple grasped the teachings immediately and thoroughly and putting them into practice he attained to Brahman. Practice, that's very important. So the teachings of the Katopanishad clearly state there are two distinctly different types of experiences and are just the two paths may be called the pleasant and the good. The pleasant path binds the good path releases. Choosing the good leads to liberation. Choosing the pleasurable leads to incarceration. If you pursue only the path of pleasure, you leave the path of realization of the highest goal of man far behind. Choosing the path of good requires exercising the refined intellect, the power of discrimination, the Atman is pure, unwavering awareness. It is agitationless. It is consciousness, infinite and full. Our innermost essence is Atman. We are not the body, mind or senses. We are not the individual with name and form. The Atman is not the knower, the known or even knowledge. Discovering this is the supreme vision. Teaching this is the supreme instruction. The instructor is Brahman. The instruction is Brahman. The instructed is also Brahman. So the Atman is the eternal unchanging witness within. This mystery cannot be understood through logic. It must be experienced by diverting the mind from its natural habitat. The objective world until it becomes a placid lake reflecting the reality of the effulgent Atman. By purifying the buddhic principle of higher mind, the illusion of the object, universe, dissolves and the vision of Atman is glimpsed. The image of the sun in a lake 
quivers and shakes due to the quivering and shaking of the waters the sun is but a distant witness it is unaffected by the media which produces the images likewise the atman is a witness of all this change in space and time now bhagavad gita tells about the inner essence bhagavad gita literally the song of god it is a recording of a conversation between lord krishna and arjun krishna is one of the incarnations of god and arjun is embodied being it is one of the most popular works of literature in the east although small in volume it has within it all the essence of the vedas the bhagavad gita contains one of the most potent and lucid explanations of this inner essence referred to as the atman know this atman unborn undying never ceasing never beginning deathless birthless unchanging forever how can it die the death of the body worn out garments are shed by the body worn out bodies are shed by the atman new bodies are donned like garments not wounded by weapons nor burned by fire not dried by the wind not wetted by water such is the atman he who dwells within all living bodies remains forever indestructible therefore never mourn for any one he must be free from the pairs of opposites poise you poise your mind in tranquility be established in the consciousness of the atman always you must not desire for the fruits of your work perform every action with your heart fixed on the supreme lord be even tempered in success and failure be even tempered in success and failure unite the heart with brahman and then act that is the secret of non attachment he who sees his lord within every creature deathlessly dwelling amidst the mortal that man sees truly now what are the hallmarks of an illumined man he knows bliss in the atman and wants nothing else cravings torment the heart he renounces cravings not shaken by adversity not hankering after happiness free from fear free from anger free from the things of desire he is lucky and does not rejoice he is unlucky and does not weep the tortoise can draw in his legs the seer can draw in his senses i call him illumined the absent run away from what they desire but they carry their desires with them when a man enters reality he leaves his desires behind him the wandering winds of the senses cast men's minds adrift when a man can still the senses i call him illumined the recollected mind is awake in the knowledge of the atman the ignorant are awake in their sense life which they think is daylight to the seer it is darkness the bhagavad gita touches on the entire spectrum of vedantic wisdom here shri krishna is discussing the cyclical nature of all things all the worlds and even the heavenly world of brahma the creator are subject to the law of rebirth but for the man who comes to me what krishna says there is no returning just as there is day and night on earth there is also day and night in the universe the wise know this as a day and night of brahma each a thousand ages in span when their day dawns all those lives that lay hidden asleep come forth and show themselves mortally manifest night falls and all are dissolved in the sleeping germ of life behind the manifest and the unmanifest there is another existence which is eternal and changeless this is not dissolved in the general dissolution it has been called the unmanifest avyakta the imperishable to reach it to reach it is said to be the greatest of all achievements it is the highest state of being 
those who reach it are not reborn the highest state of being can only be achieved through devotion to him in whom all creatures exist and by whom this universe is pervaded the bhagavad gita is that eastern classic renowned as the ultimate text for generating in the devotee emotional and devotional attachment to god the events leading up to its writing by vyasa reveal the significance of this classic the great sage vyasa said to be an incarnation of a part of vishnu the preserver aspect recognized the single body of the veda into the four major categories known today he also wrote down the puranas itihasas and the mahabharata which also contains within it the bhagavad gita although this was an immense effort by human standards vyasa still felt a disturbing unrest which he did not understand it happened that the omniscient wandering sage narad visited vyasa as he was trying to discover the cause of his unrest narad of course knew the cause and in fact had stopped by exactly for the purpose of enlightening vyasa with this knowledge narad said to sage vyasa we have not adequately described the unsullied glory of the supreme lord i consider as imperfect all those philosophies which fail to please the lord because of their lack of devotional exuberance knowledge does not shine with dazzling brilliance if it is devoid of the fervor of devotion to the supreme being therefore o mahatma you who are endowed with unerring insight to through samadhi the highest meditative state in which the knowledge of the universe can be accessed recall the memories of those wonderful deeds of the sportive lord and expound the same for the salvation of all mankind reveal for the benefit of the common man in the spiritual activities of the supreme being through his cosmic manifestations a person devoted to the lord is never caught up in this repetitive process of samsara birth and death in the world of illusion like one devoted only to vedic ritual or desire prompted activities for whoever comes to be attracted by the lord who is all bliss is constantly attached to his service and never feels inclined to live the same lived by worldly enjoyments and so acting on the promptings of narad vyasa chose in a in a specially sacred spot along the banks of the saraswati river purified himself with special rites and entered into samadhi in his mind purified and made concentrated through divine love he had the perfect vision of the supreme being he realized that the panacea for the sufferings of men caught up in the worldly illusion of maya was devotion to supreme that illumined sage therefore composed the bhagavat puran the ultimate scripture of devotion to teach man that the easiest means to dispel the darkness of ignorance is through the development of devotion even by starting its study or listening to it the mind of man develops bhakti or devotion to supreme being which destroys all his sorrow infatuation and fear the bhagavata describes the various descents of the supreme being into form and the activities and events surrounding them through time of all the sacred texts reading of the bhagavat engenders emotional states of devotion and bliss as the mind basks in the uplifting stories of the divine descents the bhagavat contains stories of the amazing activities of the various avatars or descendants of god on earth as well as of the devotees disciples and sages who were attracted by them here is an example of a story from the bhagavat of one such pure devotee who attained the ultimate goal even in a very short period of time in the solar dynasty there was once a ruler who was mighty in prowess heroic on the field prolific in charity upright in character and just in his dealings he was named katwanga he had no equal no one who could challenge him 
Meanwhile, the wicked Daityas and Dhanavas, the Asuras, mustered their forces and went to war against the Devas. The gods were afraid of being overhelped. They realized their weakness and came down to earth and sought help from King Katwanga. The king was also longing for the adventure, adventure of battle. So he collected his bow and arrows and riding in his chariot, he proceeded to the scene of war. There he shook the hearts of the Daityas and Dhanavas by sheer terror of his valor. The enemy fled in panic, unable to withstand the terrific onslaught. Since it is immortal, since it is immoral to subject a fleeing foe to hard pursuit, Katwanga desisted from further clashes. The gods were happy that they could achieve victory through the timely help of Katwanga. They praised his might and his sense of righteousness. Then they said to him, O king, there is no one who can compare with you in contemporary history. You granted us triumph in this deadly struggle against the forces of evil. We desire that you should accept from us in return any help that you need that we can render. The king told them, O gods, ritual, yajnas and yagas are performed by men to please you, isn't it? This battle in which I had the privilege to participate is therefore a yajna, so far as I am concerned. What else do I need from you than this grace that you have showered on me, this adequate boon. Declaring thus, Katwanga fell at the feet of the gods. Not satisfied with this reply, the gods compelled him to ask for something, some boon from them. Though Katwanga had no mind to ask for anything, he was forced to frame some wish, since he felt he would not be left alone. At last he said, O gods, reveal to me how many years more I shall live. Only then can I decide which boon I can ask from you. Like that Katwanga asks, Indra, the monarch of the gods, is all-knowing. And so without a moment's delay, King rep- the Indra replied, O king, your span of life is very nearly over. You can live only for one more muhurta. That means, just a few minutes, your life will be over. On hearing this, Katwanga said, I have nothing to ask. I don't need anything. I feel that all the pleasures of this world and the next are trifles to be discarded. I shall not enter again the slush of sensory pleasure. Give me the boon of attaining to the sublime presence of the Lord, from which there is no return for which all life is dedicated. Then the Katwanga sat with closed eyes, repeating the name of God, and at the end of the Muhurta, he achieved the lotus feet of Lord Hari. He got liberated, because he knew his time is over, so he fully concentrated upon the Divine, and got himself liberated. So like that you feel lots of uh, sublime teachings from the scriptures. As Sri Ramakrishna says, you should read them attentively and most important, practice them. Practice part, action part. That is very important. Then only you can liberate yourself from all the sufferings of the world and you will enjoy the immense peace and bliss. Page 934 (coughs) Sri Ramakrishna said, At the hour of the evening worship in the Kali temple, I would climb to the roof of the Kuti and cry out, cry out, O devotees, where are you all? Come to me soon. I shall die of the company of worldly people. I told all this to the Englishmen. They said it was all an illusion of my mind. Perhaps it is, I said to myself, and became calm. But now it is all coming true. The devotees are coming. The Divine Mother also showed me in a vision the five suppliers of my needs. First, Madhur Babu. Second, Shambhu Malik, whom I had not then met. 
had a vision of a fair skinned man with a dick with a cap on his head many days later when i first met shambhu i recalled that vision i realized that it was he whom i had seen in that ecstatic state i have not yet found out the three other suppliers of my wants but they were all of a fair complexion surendra looks like one of them when i attained this state of god consciousness a person exactly resembling myself thoroughly shook my ida pingala and sushumna nerves he licked with his tongue each of the lotuses of the six centers and those drooping lotuses at once turned their faces upward and at last the sahasrara lotus became full blown the divine mother used to reveal to me the nature of the devotees before their coming i saw with these two eyes not in a trance the kirtan party of chaitanya going from the banyan tree to the bakul tree in the panchavati i saw balram in the procession also and also i think yourself meaning yam chuni's spiritual consciousness and you was to have been awakened by frequent visits to me in a vision i saw that shashi and sharat had been among the followers of christ under the banyan tree in the panchavati i had a vision of a child Radha said to me, "Then a son will soon be born to you." I said to him, "But I regard all women as mother. How can I have a son? That child is Rakhav." I said to the Divine Mother, "O oh Mother, since you have placed me in this condition, provide me with a rich man." That's why Madhur served me for fourteen years, and in how many different ways? At my request, he arranged a special store room for the sadhus. He provided me with carriage and palanquin, and whatever I asked him to give to anyone, he gave. The Brahmani identified him with Prataparudra. Vijaya had a vision of this form, meaning himself. How do you account for it? Vijaya said to me, "I touched it exactly as I am touching you now." Latu counted thirty-one devotees in all. That's not many, but a few more are becoming devotees through Vijaya. and kedar it is revealed to me in a vision that during my last days i should have to live on pudding during my present illness my wife was one day feeding me with pudding i burst into tears and said is this my living on pudding near the end and so painfully so stop you so scriptures have got value one should practice it according to the instructions given in the scripture chant the name of the lord and his glory unceasingly that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire worldly lust raging furiously within whole name stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart opening its cup to know the thyself o self down deep in the veins of his bliss tasting his nectar at every step bathing in his name that bow for very souls very so thy name so lord In each and every name, Thy power resides. No times are set, no rites are needful for chanting of Thy name. So vast is Thy mercy. How huge then is Thy wretchedness! Who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to Thy name? O oh, my mind, be humbler than a blade of grass. Be patient and forbearing like a tree. Take no honor to Thyself. Give honor to all. Chant and sing in the name of the Lord. O oh Lord and Soul of the universe. Mine is no prayer for wealth or anything. The prayer things of lust or the price of fame. As many times, as I am very born, grant me, O Lord, this has passed now for thee. A governing man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one. In thy mercy, consider the mass just beneath thy feet. Oh, how I long for the day when an instant separation from thee, O Lord, will be as a thousand years, when the heart burns away with its desire, and the world without thee. The heartless void, prostrate at thy feet, let me be in unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence. Though it tears my soul asunder, O thou who stillest the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, but thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness up to light, and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers. May all realize what is good. May all be actually the noble thoughts. May all joy is everywhere. May all be happy. May all be free from disease. May all realize what is good. May none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous. 
May the virtues attain tranquility. May the tranquil be free from bonds. May the free make others free. May good bear all people. May the sovereign righteously rule the earth. May all beings ever attain what is good. May the world be prosperous and happy. May the clouds blow rain in time. May the earth be blessed with crops. May all countries be freed from calamity. May holy men live without fear. May the Lord, the destroyer of sins, the presiding deity of all the sacred works, be satisfied. For He being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He being satisfied, the whole universe feels satisfied.